welcome to Reading Aloud, the programme full of inspirational ideas about books for the classroom. This is the oldest working cinema in the country. They've been showing films here since 1909. But it's not just celluloid heroes and villains that put in an appearance here. The Electric, here in Birmingham, has witnessed plenty of spiritual and ghostly things going on. Yes, it's the perfect place to present this spooky edition of Reading Aloud, all about supernatural and horror fiction. Coming up, witchcraft and sorcery in the classroom, a novel that's cast its spell on these young readers, Best-selling horror writer Darren Shan on the teen appeal of terror. You read a horror book to be scared. You read a horror book to have nightmares. And is Stephen King's Carrie a cult classic or mildly pornographic? During the Second World War, this basement of the old cinema was requisitioned as a makeshift mortuary, and many victims of bombings died here, and some, it seems, were reluctant to leave. Tom Laws, what sort of spooky or horrible things have gone on here? Um, without doubt, the worst thing that's been reported here was during the war, a man shot himself whilst watching uh, the newsreels. Um, at the end of the day, when the staff asked people to leave, that the guy was slumped in the corner and it was evident that he had died. And since then, the, many of the staff over the years have reported all sorts of stuff going on. They've had winds, cold winds go past them. They've claimed just a feeling of eeriness. And certainly staff, when they first arrive here and they're not used to the building, they will not come into this basement on their own. Well, it's the fascination with stories like that that make the supernatural and occult so popular. The men in tall hats dragged my grandmother from the stinking hole where they had been keeping her. Then. They threw her in. The crowd watched in silence. The only sound, the shuffle of many feet, edging forwards to see what she would do. She floats. The chant started with just one person remarking in a quiet voice, almost of wonder. Then it spread from one to another until all were shouting with one voice, like some monstrous howling thing, to float was sure proof of guilt. So where did the idea for this novel set amid the witch hunts of the 17th century come from? I was a teacher in Coventry for 16 years and I taught English and that's really when I started to write because I became really interested in uh, what pupils were interested in reading and why they'd stopped reading, some of the older ones had stopped reading and I suppose like lots of people I thought I could write something they'd like to read so that's how I started writing. At Hall Green Secondary School, the book has been a big hit with these Year 10 students. Then it was the turn of the beast who brought with us. I was a bit concerned in the beginning. I thought maybe it was a bit too easy for them as a young read. Uh, they're a top set, very, very able GCSE group. Um, but they absolutely took it on board. And because some of them have the interest in, in this, the subject matter anyway, they find it very interesting and very readable. Um, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and I think they fed off that as well. And as a group, we enjoyed reading it all together. Witchcraft exists. Tell me about the debating groups that got set up. Well, we first of all, what we did was divided the class up so that I knew um, who was a believer and who wasn't and who were kind of stuck in the middle. And I used that as a basis for forming these debating groups. And what they had were just some statements um, around the issues in the book. Um, and they talked about it in those debating groups and got some quite lively discussions from it. It's like God or something. Some people don't think he exists, some people do. They kind of expanded on it themselves. They started believing in the power of God and good against the power of evil. And it led to something a lot bigger than I expected it to. And I found that this was a good way of getting them actually into the issues of the book and thinking about the wider elements of it as well. She's a witch. Oh my God, she knows. How do you know? The students used drama to explore the story. I think by exploring drama work like this, um, they tend to get involved a lot quicker. They um, relate to the characters. 
um, the storyline, the plot, the language all comes through um, through their drama, which is really interesting. So they just need something to kind of lift it off that page and to make it more real to them. Kind knows kind, kind knows kind, kind knows kind. Makes me want to read more witchcraft stories. The book was quite good because I liked the idea of it being like a diary. I wasn't expecting to really like it because normally when we read books at school they're a bit boring, a bit tedious. But this one was actually, it was different from other books that we've read and I liked it, I thought it was good. I think historical fiction is still relevant because it's a really good way of learning about the past and experiencing what happens in the past. And often, I don't, I, I personally don't think we can understand the present unless we know about the past. Do you know, one of the first books ever written down in England is a horror story. There's a scene where a group of soldiers are asleep in a hall and a grim and greedy monster strides in and rips them to pieces. Beowulf, one of the most famous plays ever written, has a scene where a kind old man has his eyes ripped out. King Lear. And one of the most famous of all horror stories is really a plea for more human behaviour. Frankenstein. So why is it that we think of horror stories as slightly seedy or trashy? Might they not really be ways in which we can experience fear without facing danger? Well, in that case, they're therapy. But are some horror stories more therapeutic than others? Well, the answer lies in the anti-Boris. What's the anti-Boris, you ask? Ah, well, the Boris is my nickname for the horror, whatever that might be, named after, of course, Boris Karloff, who played Frankenstein's monster. The anti-Boris is what overcomes the Boris. Now, if there's no anti-Boris at all in your story, not very therapeutic. If the anti-Boris is something magical or supernatural, I don't think that's very therapeutic. If it's the army, the navy, the powers of the state, the police, that's OK. The really therapeutic anti-Boris is when it's the wit and wisdom of our hero. In King Lear, that's the power of love. Now, how good is that? One of the world's most successful and prolific writers of teenage horror fiction is Darren Shan. He sold over 10 million books and the legion of Shan fans can't seem to get enough of the blood-curdling gore-fest dreamed up by this 34-year-old writer. Sometimes parents will say to me, I'm very worried that my books will give children nightmares. And I always say, well, no, they're horror books. That's sort of the whole point. <laughs> you read a horror book to be scared. You read a horror book to have nightmares. Um, a ho really good horror book, a horror movie, is like a roller coaster ride. It's really, really scary, but it's also fun. The thing about a fictional horror is it's safe. If you wake up in the middle of your night in reality and you hear somebody moving about downstairs, that's truly horrific. That's a certain kind of realistic horror. But if you're reading about it, then that's fun. It's fun to scare yourself. It's fun to creep yourself out. So I think a lot of people who don't read horror miss out on the fun side. They can only see the horrific elements. They don't realise horror is fun. We've read all the vampires. We haven't started on this one. It starts very bluntly. The first couple of chapters are the most gruesome right. things I've written about. Darren Shan has been turning out books at a phenomenal rate five or six a year at one stage. So where does he go from here? I want to push myself as hard as I can and just keep on writing. One of my role models is Stephen King. and I love the fact he's always pushed himself. He could have retired years ago if he'd wanted, but he's always kept going. He's always written as much as he can, put out as many books as he can. And that's what I want to do. I want to push myself to my limits and just keep writing. Here we go. Thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs> Bye, Callum. And Darren's role model, Stephen King, the so-called master of horror, wrote the book that we're looking at this week, Carrie. The story, which was made into a big movie starring Sissy Spacek, is about a teenager with alarming telekinetic powers. Then, the stones. Right out of the blue sky, whistling and screaming like bombs. My mother cried out, what in the name of God, and put her hands over her head. One of them hit a downspout and knocked it into the lawn. Others punched holes right through the roof and into the attic. The roof made a big cracking sound each time one hit, and puffs of dust would squirt up. The ones that hit the ground would make everything vibrate. You could feel them hitting in your feet. But nothing, nothing that wasn't on the Carrie White's property was hit. 
well, plenty of telekinesis there. Um, Darren, Stephen King is known as the master of the horror genre, if you like, so what makes this book a horror book? It's got all natural ingredients that you'd expect. It's got the blood, it's got the guts, it's got the gore. Um, for me personally, what really strikes me as horrific in this is the treatment of the main character by her so-called school friends, uh, the con persistent bullying that she's had to go through through her entire school life. And then when she gets home, she's got this really oppressive, uh, fanatical religious mother who is giving her even more bullying, if you like. Yes, I mean, a horror, the horror genre nearly always requires someone innocent at the heart of it, mm -hmm. and so quite often the stereotype is that that should be a woman. Does that work for you, John? This is the first horror book I've ever read, but I have to admit that I absolutely hated it. And though it's a strong word to use, I think the book is mildly pornographic, in the sense that the very first scene in which a shower room full of undressed girls verbally abuse a naked undressed girl and throw sanitary towels at her. I think that is there actually for the entertainment of the readership and the possible arousal of an intended largely young male readership. It seems to me it is, it is emphasising all of the worst kind of sexist and male dominant stereotypes about women and women's bodies and women's personalities and that's my particular problem with it. I just think sometimes we can, we can overanalyze things and, and for me the whole fascination behind horror of which Carrie is part of is that it excites that, um, that, that roller coaster gene and I'm quite happy picking up a book like this if it's going to scare me and not really overanalyze the intentions maybe of the author or, or, or what other intentions he may, he may have had. Let me stop you there. Uh, my own feeling about it was that it was on the side of the victim. Winsome? I don't know if it was on the side of the victim, but it gave you a true picture of the victim. It made you empathise with the victim. I felt that um, he, he didn't give her thoughts and that to me made her not a rounded character. So we've got a bit of a problem here, haven't we? It's a book that two of you disapprove mm. of, but then we might have a class of teenagers mm. not reading, we want them to read, would we put it in front of them and say, here we are, read this one? Definitely not. Um, there are far better books out there, um, books targeted at teenagers who would actually bring them on board with um, much better plots and characters and all of that. I mean, John, it is a horror book. Aren't you supposed to be horrified by it, offended by it? It is not the specific things in it and their horribleness that is upsetting me. It is my understanding of the intention of this writer in putting those particularly horrible things before us. Darren? It's a cracking yarn and I like to read it, read a good story, curl up in bed, not be able to sleep for three hours afterwards because of it. Well, that's about it from this spine-tingling edition of Reading Aloud. Just one final thought from Stephen King. He once said, People think I must be a very strange person. This is not correct. I have the heart of a small boy. It's in a glass jar on my desk. Bye.